Hello, this is Eric Strong again, and for the 16th lecture, I'll be talking about oxygenation and the AA gradient. This lecture marks a major transition point in this course on understanding ABGs, where I move from discussing acid-base disorders and focus now on disorders of oxygenation. The learning objectives of this lecture are to know the difference between hypoxia and hypoxemia, to be familiar with the alveolar gas equation and understand how it is used to calculate the AA gradient, and finally to understand how the AA gradient impacts the differential diagnosis of hypoxia. The first thing to discuss is the difference between the terms hypoxia and hypoxemia. Although they are frequently used interchangeably, it's important to realize that they are not synonymous. Hypoxia is a condition where either all or a specific part of the body does not receive or is not able to use adequate oxygen to maintain aerobic metabolism. Hypoxemia, on the other hand, is a reduction in the concentration of oxygen in arterial blood. Another way to look at it is that hypoxia is more of a general pathophysiologic state that is, to some extent, subjective at the bedside, while hypoxemia is defined by an objective and easily identifiable abnormal parameter of gas exchange and transport. The most common clinically relevant etiology of hypoxia is in fact hypoxemia. In other words, the most common reason that peripheral tissues do not receive adequate oxygen from metabolism is because the concentration of oxygen in the blood is too low. However, there are several other etiologies that should be considered. Severe anemia, which is a, in essence a reduction in the concentration of hemoglobin, can lead to hypoxia by decreasing the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. Dishemoglobinemias, specifically states of high concentrations of either met hemoglobin or carboxyhemoglobin, lead to hypoxia through interesting and unique mechanisms that will be described in detail in Lecture 19. Finally, there is the somewhat esoteric category of histotoxic hypoxia, which refers to tissue hypoxia that is the consequence of malfunctioning mitochondria, best described in, in cyanide poisoning. How is oxygen transported in the body? There are two mechanisms of delivery. First, some oxygen is dissolved into the liquid portion of blood. The rest is bound to hemoglobin within red blood cells. Which of these two mechanisms is predominantly responsible for oxygen transport? The oxygen dissolved in arterial blood accounts for only about 1.5% of the total oxygen transported from the lungs to the peripheral tissues, while the oxygen bound to hemoglobin accounts for about 98.5%. The means used to assess each of these mechanisms of delivery is as follows. For the oxygen dissolved in blood, we assess that by examining the P little a O2, or the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, which is directly measured from the ABG. For the oxygen bound to hemoglobin, we usually assess this by examining the SpO2, which refers to the percentage of hemoglobin which is bound to oxygen as measured directly from a pulse oximeter. An alternative to the SpO2 is a frequently overlooked value called the SAO2, which refers to the percentage of hemoglobin bound to oxygen as calculated by the ABG analyzer using a rather complex algorithm. The SAO2 can be also directly measured by a device known as a coaximeter, which is a more reliable but is infrequently used due to the coaximeter's expense and physical size. Both SPO2 and SAO2 are colloquially referred to as the O2 sat. I have found it to be really common on the wards for healthcare pro providers to rely more heavily on the PAO2 than the O2 sat for assessing oxygenation when both are available, despite the fact that the O2 sat is a measure of 98.5% of the oxygen transport and in some ways is thus a more reliable index of oxygenation. Reviews in which the accuracy of the pulse ox is called into question generally cite papers in which the SpO2 is compared to SaO2 as measured by coximeter as a standard, which as I mentioned earlier is rarely done in clinical practice. There are however several circumstances in which the pulse oximeter may be less reliable than usual, which I will discuss in lecture 19.
While I believe that the PaO2 is generally inferior to the SpO2 or pulse ox in assessing the presence of hypoxia, it is very helpful in narrowing down the etiology of hypoxia as a consequence of its incorporation into the assessment of the AA gradient. So let's talk about the AA gradient, which stands for the alveolar arterial gradient. To better understand this value, I'm going to revisit this diagram from lecture two. As I'm sure you know, carbon dioxide from the returning mixed venous blood diffuses from the pulmonary capillary bed into the alveoli, while oxygen from within the alveoli diffuses into the pulmonary capillaries and leaves into the systemic circulation. The first of the two pressures that are important in the AA gradient is the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. This is abbreviated P big A O2. Then there is the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood, which is abbreviated P little a O2. The AA gradient is the mathematical difference between these two values, which is a reflection of the difficulty oxygen has at crossing the alveolar capillary membrane. Here's another way to look at the AA gradient. It is equal to the P big A O2 minus the P little a O2. While the P little a O2 is measured directly from the ABG, there is no easy means by which the P big A O2 can be measured. Therefore, it must be estimated using the alveolar gas equation. To remind you, here is the alveolar gas equation. What do these unfamiliar variables represent? FiO2 is the fractional concentration of oxygen in inspired air. Pi is the total barometric pressure of inspired air. And P H2O is the partial pressure of water in the alveoli. RQ is an interesting variable known as the respiratory quotient. The respiratory quotient in the most basic sense is the ratio between carbon dioxide production and oxygen consumption and is related to the patient's diet. This equation is a little unwieldy, but luckily in some circumstances it can be simplified. For example, uh, for a patient breathing room air at sea level, the FiO2 is 21% or 0.21, Pi is 760 millimeters of mercury, and pH2O is 47 millimeters of mercury. These three values simplify to 150. Furthermore, the respiratory quotient, while dependent upon a person's diet, specifically upon the relative amounts of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins a person is eating, it is remarkably constant at 0.8 for all but the most extreme and unusual of diets. Since the measurement of RQ in an individual patient is a very challenging and time-consuming task, it is almost always assumed to be 0.8. So here it is, the simplified alveolar gas equation for a patient breathing room air at sea level. I find the derivation of the alveolar gas equation to be fascinating, as are the potential variations in the respiratory quotient. While these topics fall outside the scope of this particular lecture, for those interested, I recommend uh, taking a look at my soon-to-be-completed supplemental lecture to this course that will discuss these in more detail. So now that we can estimate P big A O2, and since P little a O2 can be measured directly, we can now calculate the AA gradient. However, we need something to compare it to in order to know if a patient's AA gradient is actually abnormal. Unfortunately, there is no one normal range for the AA gradient because it increases with age. There are several equations floating around that will allow one to estimate the normal AA gradient for age, all of which are empirically derived. I don't think anyone can really say which equation is best per se or most accurate, but the most frequently employed one is this. The normal AA gradient in millimeters of mercury is equal to the patient's age in years divided by four plus four. You should also note that the normal AA gradient also increases with higher FiO2 and can be over 100 millimeters of mercury in an elderly patient breathing 100% oxygen. This will be discussed more in the next lecture. So what does the AA gradient tell us about the hypoxemic patient? If the AA gradient is normal, 
the cause of the hypoxemia must be either hypoventilation, that is, increased PaCO2, or low barometric pressure, which would happen only at extreme elevations, as in greater than 10,000 feet above sea level. If the AA gradient is elevated, the cause of the hypoxemia must be either a VQ mismatch, shunt, or impaired diffusion across the alveolar capillary membrane. All of these will be discussed in Lecture 18. There are several alternative measures of oxygenation beyond simple P little a O2 and the AA gradient. The most relevant, at least in terms of adult medicine, is the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. This is occasionally used as a measure of severity of hypoxemia in the ICU. For a young, healthy adult breathing room air, P little a O2 would be expected to be about 100 and FiO2 would be 0.21, which would give a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio of 476 millimeters of mercury. An abnormal ratio is typically placed into one of two categories. Values of 200 to 300 are consistent with a mild to moderate gas exchange abnormality, while values under 200 are consistent with a severe gas exchange abnormality. The clinical correlate of this distinction is that a patient with multifocal lung opacities, no apparent heart failure, and a ratio of 200 to 300 is said to have acute lung injury Whereas, if the ratio is under 200, the patient is said to have acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. The actual cutoffs of 300 and 200 are, of course, arbitrary, and thus so is the near meaningless distinction between acute lung injury and ARDS. At this point, I'd like to go through two examples of how to use the PaO2 and the AA gradient to better understand a clinical scenario. Example 1. An 83-year-old woman with dementia is sent to the emergency room from her skilled nursing facility after she was found to be tachypnic and hypoxic. On arrival, she is in distress. Temperature is 101 degrees. Heart rate is 115. BP 135 over 86. Respiratory rate 35. And O2 sat is 75% on room air. Her breaths are rapid and shallow. And here is her ABG on room air, uh, which is always critical to specify. Step one will be to check the AA gradient. So here is the alveolar gas equation to calculate P big A O2. Remember this simplifies to 150 minus the PaCO2, which is 26 in this case, divided by 0 0.8. This equals 118 millimeters of mercury. Thus the AA gradient is 118 minus 41, which is 77 millimeters of mercury. Step two is to estimate the normal AA gradient for this patient. Using the previously mentioned equation, the normal gradient equals age divided by four plus four, and we get 25 millimeters of mercury for her. So what does this tell us about this particular patient? Well, first she is hypoxemic, we know that because her O2sat and PaO2 are both very low. I haven't previously discussed the lower limits of these values, which is largely because there actually aren't well-defined lower limits. I think a good general rule of thumb, however, for a lower limit is 96% for the O2sat, and for the PaO2, 85 millimeters of mercury for a child or relatively young adult, and 75 millimeters of mercury for the elderly. So again, she is hypoxemic, and she's actually severely hypoxemic at this point, with an O2sat that is critically low, low enough that, even without more information, we can say that she is almost certainly experiencing generalized hypoxia. That is, her vital organs and peripheral tissues, such as her skeletal muscles, are not receiving adequate oxygenation to maintain normal aerobic metabolism, and as a consequence, she's likely undergoing an increased amount of anaerobic metabolism, resulting in lactic acidosis. As to the cause of the hypoxemia, her AA gradient is significantly increased over the expected gradient for her age. Therefore, the cause is not related to hypoventilation. With more experience, you may have seen that immediately from the ABG without needing calculations, 
as the low PaCO2 is not consistent with hypoventilation. In other words, a good clinical pearl is that if a patient has both a low PaCO2 and a low PaO2, you know that the AA gradient must be elevated. So what is her likely diagnosis? An elderly patient with dementia presenting with hypoxic respiratory failure has a long differential diagnosis. However, at the top of the list would certainly be pneumonia and or aspiration pneumonitis, though I would also consider acute lung injury or emerging ARDS secondary to sepsis from an as of yet unidentified source. Let's take a look at another example. A 56-year-old man with a history of coronary artery disease, hypertension, and 60 pack years of smoking presents to the emergency room with a productive cough and dyspnea for three days. On exam, his respiratory rate is 28, and O2 saturation is 81% on room air. His breaths are shallow and with pursed lips. Here is his ABG. If we are just focusing on his oxygenation, step one will be to check his AA gradient. Here is the alveolar gas equation. So is P big A O2 equals 150 minus 60 divided by 0 0.8, which is 75 millimeters of mercury. His AA gradient is therefore 75 minus 57, or 18 millimeters of mercury. Step two is to estimate the normal or expected AA gradient for his age. For him, this is 56 divided by four plus four, which is 18 millimeters of mercury. So his current AA gradient is equal to his normal AA gradient for his age. What does this mean? This means that the cause of his hypoxemia must be solely hypoventilation. This is an important result when we consider the differential diagnosis of his overall presentation. Without the ABG, if we were just told that the patient presents with cough and shortness of breath, and he's found to be tachypnic and hypoxemic, one might be most concerned about pneumonia. However, when pneumonia causes hypoxemia, it does so by either causing VQ mismatch or functional shunt, both of which lead to high AA gradients. Since his gradient is normal, we know that pneumonia is not the predominant etiology of his illness. In considering his particular case, a heavy smoker who presents with cough and dyspnea, who is found to have hypoventilation with a normal AA gradient, the most likely explanation is a COPD exacerbation. The ABG makes an important difference in treatment here. While current COPD guidelines would still recommend this patient be treated with antibiotics, it would also strongly recommend treatment with steroids, an intervention that would one would be unlikely to prescribe if pneumonia was mistakenly believed to be the likely diagnosis. Patients with COPD exacerbations and hypoventilation also have improved outcomes when treated with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation such as BiPAP which would also be unlikely to have been prescribed if this presentation were thought to be due to pneumonia. That concludes this lecture on the AA gradient. The next lecture will cover how to evaluate oxygenation in a patient who is on supplemental oxygen.